So, hello and welcome to another one of these lives. Um, as those of you who are regular viewers, I guess, will know, um, once a month I try to do a live with a Ukrainian teacher of English to amplify Ukrainian voices during Russia's continued war of aggression on Ukraine. I've also been trying to do some other lives just with teachers I've come across who I thought are doing interesting things and speaking about interesting things. And as you may know, a couple of weeks ago, I went to Astana in Kazakhstan for the Scholarium con Conference. And while I was there, I saw a couple of really interesting, really excellent talks. And one of them um, was by a, a Kazakhstani teacher of Spanish called Alex. Um, she'll correct me in a minute if I'm wrong, but I think she's from Karganda. Um, and I really enjoyed the talk and invited her on today to talk about accents and about teaching listening and about some of the similarities between the way she was talking and thinking about teaching Spanish and the way that I think and talk about teaching English. So I'm hoping she's there and if she is, Alex, um, ask to join the live and I'll add you and we can get started. Hi to everyone joining us, by the way. So let me just see, I think that's her. Let's see. Let me try one more time. I'm sorry. Yes, that seems hello. to work. Hey, hello, Alex. How are you? Fine. And you? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I don't know if you know, but we've got the final of the Euro. Oh, you probably know. What we've yeah, been I heard about it. Teacher. Um, we, we've got the final of the Euros tonight. So, um, you know, it's quite kind of excited vibe going on in London at the moment. Oh, yeah, I, I can understand. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing by, by job definition, you have to be supporting Spain tonight, no? Oh, you know, I'm so not really into all this football team thing, but okay, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> in which case, you can support England. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Welcome. Thank you for giving up your time to be here. I know yeah, thank you for inviting me here. I know you're a few hours ahead. Are you in Karaganda? Did I get that right? I'm in Uskaminogorsk. Ah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> it's kind of getting on for, what is it, like nine o'clock or something where you are now? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. It's nine o'clock here. So thank you for giving up your time. Um, do you want to just say a little bit about yourself and who you are and what you do? And then we'll kind of go on to y your conference talk and talk about that a bit more. Okay, thank you. So um, I am a teacher of Spanish. Uh, initially, I started um, about 14 years ago. I was a teacher of English and Spanish and Portuguese as well. But English was the most popular because it's an international language and so on. But then three years ago, um, I switched to online teaching and um, I found a lot of people willing to learn Spanish. So I had to dedicate myself fully to Spanish teaching because I love Spanish and these days I don't have much practice of English as you might hear but yeah so now I'm a full-time online Spanish teacher and I'm an daily and CLE exams trainer as well. It, it, it scares me that you speak Spanish and Portuguese at least as well as you speak English because <laughs> that, that means you speak what four languages five languages? Um, I speak I speak also a little bit of Kazakh and a little bit of Ukrainian because my grandfather was from Ukraine and I was born and grew up here in Kazakhstan, but still uh, I can understand a lot and I can just say some words. So um, I, I can speak more or less six languages all in all. Jesus, this, this scares me. Um, <laughs> you know, as someone who basically kind of speaks one, one, and, one and a half languages with, with tiny little bits of other languages, it's, um, did, did you have any um, secrets to your learning? Um, I guess that I just cannot do anything else. This is <laughs> the only thing I can do is learn languages and teach languages, nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm, I'm not sure that's the usual advice that polyglots give, but um, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> I'm just trying to be, be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't want to kind of um, steal your, your thunder, but maybe you can just say a little bit about the... What, what, so when I was watching you do your talk, I mean, it was funny because I went along not realizing you were going to be talking about Spanish teaching. Um, I think your talk was just called like accent and, and speed in listening comprehension or something. Yeah. And I thought that just sounded interesting in itself. And then I found you were talking about Spanish and it was like, mm, OK. But then as you got going, there, there seems to be a lot of overlap. So maybe if you don't mind, could you talk a little bit more about just the kind of issue of accent for Spanish learners? and what your take on that is and why it's difficult and what issues come up when people are talking about and learning about different accents. So yeah, um, in Spanish, what we call acento, it's a kind of a dialect because it, as you know, Sp Spanish is spoken in many, many countries as a native language. And in all of these countries, they have their local variations. So Spanish in Spain is different from Spanish in Argentina or Bolivia or Venezuela or any other Spanish speaking country. As well as uh, in Spain, for example, they also have regional dialects so the Canary Spanish is not the same as Spanish in, for example, Toledo in, in like, or like in the center of Spain. So we have a lot of differences in pronunciation throughout this whole Spanish-speaking world. And the other problem is that they speak really fast. So normally when Spanish speakers start talking, they would do it very, very fast. And... Um, this is where we normally have problems when we learn Spanish that, first of all, we don't almost don't have anything like standards. So as you heard during my conference speech, uh, one and the same word sometimes can be pronounced in different manners in different places. Yeah. So sometimes you cannot be sure that you heard the same word which you learned. You and then the examples of that, because I thought that was really interesting the way you were doing that. Yeah, I, I gave uh, these examples of like L double, like double L letter, uh, which in in Spain is normally pronounced like Y, and we have words like A Y or B Y. Uh, and this, these words, for example, uh, somewhere in Latin America, they will be pronounced like Eja in Beja because they pronounce these two letters like J. And when we go to Argentina, for example, there they pronounce it like sh. So again, this ella, ella, and in Argentina it will be pronounced esha. So when we learn vocabulary with my students, and for example, they learn a word like amarillo. And then we start listening, and sometimes we would hear a person from Argentina, for example, saying amarillo. And they need to grasp it. They need to be ready to understand that this is the same word which they learned before, but it's just pronounced in a different manner. And it's all right. And it's normal. It's what they are going to hear a lot in their so, life. So with a word like calle, which means street, yeah? yeah. And that's gonna, that the same thing's going to happen with something like that. Absolutely, yeah. In, in Latin America, you will hear calle, calle or cache and it will be just the same word calle and from what kind of level do you start telling students about this or exposing students to this from the very beginning um, actually during their first lesson it's it, like uh, they start from zero uh, during our first lesson, I normally tell them all of this, like there are different variations of Spanish. Spanish is not just one thing, and you will always hear people pronouncing words in different manner, or you will always in, have problems with like one word meaning different things in different countries. It also happens a lot. And you can find yourself in a situation where you learn something during the class, and then you talk to a native speaker, and they say, no, we don't have this word, or we do have, but it means something else, because this is what often happens in Spanish. So I just try to make them prepared so that when they start communicating in real life, they are not shocked, and they don't have this, uh, she taught me some wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
Yeah, it's like kind of preempting, preempting possible criticism further down <laughs> the line. <laughs> and you, you were saying that the the kind of the, the standard Spanish exams expect comprehension of at least three different kind of versions of Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in our standard, um, we have two standard exams, which are DELE and CLE. They're a bit um, different, but in DELE, uh, starting from level B1, you will hear different modalities of Spanish. Like A1, A2, you will only hear like uh, European Spanish, but starting from B1, you will hear different um, variations. In CLE, you will hear different variations like straight from the beginning and um normally even at a1 level they already give you like listening to mexican people or cuban people or something like this and yeah at least three but maybe more when i did my daily for example i did c2 level and um in my listening part i didn't have any european spanish at all i only wow. had different latin accents wow 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 and do you find in the way that people talk about accent within Spanish itself that there is a kind of degree of accentism or snobbery about certain kinds of accents or derogatory comments are sometimes made about other kinds of accents? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it exists. And um, I have to admit that, first of all, it exists from the native speakers. I heard a lot of Spanish people saying things like all oh, those people in latin america they speak so funny or something like this um but then what actually makes me sad and sometimes it really devastates me is when a student comes to my class and we start learning spanish and they say oh no no i don't need latin spanish i only need european because i'm going to europe or something like this um on some occasions i even heard people say i don't want to study latin american spanish because they're poor i actually heard it from my students and they have lot like all sorts of um you know stereotypes um they have some wrong ideas about what latin america is and when i ask them like have you been there yeah. have you actually met any person from latin america to say so they actually say no i've never i've never had any opportunity and then i say like okay here in kazakhstan we have uh, like people from different latin american countries why don't you just come up to them and try to communicate with them to find out that they're just the same people as you and there's nothing wrong with them and with speaking or understanding their variation of spanish so unfortunately yes it happens sometimes and um, people i think that this is the problem of um education because we actually don't have a lot of information about this part of the world it's too far away and people get a lot of information from movies you know like pop culture and in pop culture normally it's like you know a lot of stereotypes i guess just like people from kazakhstan must be thoroughly sick of the influence of things like borat absolutely uh, sure. absolutely that's what i always tell them like do you like when people start talking about borat to you <laughs> and the people are like oh my God it's horrible and uh, it's disgusting and say it's the same thing yeah. we are not borats and they are not what you but see I'm, in, yeah. you know I'm, I'm sure people from well i know from teaching colombians that people get really really sick of the association of escobar and the car yes. it's like that's the only thing people know about colombia is you know colombia's greatest export that people consume up the nose and all that kind of thing and you must get really, really tired of those kinds of stereotypes if you're a, you know, a normal Colombian, <laughs> often working, living in other parts of Europe, maybe, you know, like, obviously, I mean, if, if people do go and speak Spanish in Spain, they're going to meet people from all over Latin America, who are also working there, living there in all kinds of different jobs and in all kinds of different regions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The, the other thing that resonated with me when you were talking was I, I guess it's something that happens to all languages which have spread through colonial practices essentially so you know it happens with Russian it happens with Spanish it happens with English where the colonial center kind of imposes its language on other people 
and then laughs at them. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's sort of like a double punishment. It's kind of, we're going to make you learn our language and then we're going to mock you when you do so for not mimicking yeah. the standard uh -huh. version of the, you know, educated center. Um, and I, it happens with English as well, obviously, you know, and you do get native English speakers from England who will take the piss out of even like, you know, accents from Liverpool or, you know, South London accents or accents from Glasgow or whatever, let alone accents from, you know, India or Pakistan or Jamaica or parts of Africa or whatever. And I think it is very much rooted in those old kind of colonial attitudes and racist attitudes as well. Yeah, it, it happens a lot. It actually, once I remember when I, um, I, I, was, I was in some internet community dedicated to Spanish and we were just talking with the people about different variations and so on. And there comes a person from Spain, actually uh, a native Spanish speaker from Spain, and he says, we gave Latin Americans this precious gift of our language and look to, at what they have done to it. And I just, I just lost it. I, I was like, did they actually ask you for this gift? <laughs> did they, do you actually think that this is the way that gifts are given? And who we? It was 500 years ago. And languages are just something live. They change all the time. And it's nature for a language to be influenced by other languages, to like undergo certain changes. So how can you say that they have spoiled or they did something wrong to your language they just gave it another life and that is why we have so much variety now and so much so much diversity in in spanish which is great it's funny i mean i'm doing this course at the moment a face-to-face -face course in london this teaching lexically course and one of the conversations we had on friday actually was about pronunciation and i was kind of saying that you know you want your students to get somewhere close to some sort of pronunciation that works for them, but it's important to understand there is no one standard. And you could see teachers get quite shocked and frustrated by this concept where you basically have to say, listen, you know, if you want to try and m mimic the pronunciation in a dictionary, for example, you know, you go on the Oxford Dictionary site and you kind of go, I don't know, grass 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 and you, you kind of go grass and you go yeah fine and even for myself and my my, my co-partner my, my writing partner andrew he's from birmingham and he does the kind of hard ah like my mum from the north does so it'd be like grass and castle and that kind of thing mm -hmm. and i think for a lot of teachers that's quite a shock because it kind of pulls the rug out from under their feet and they feel like, so what's the standard and what are we supposed to aspire to then? And I wondered how you deal with that yourself with your own students in terms of what kind of pronunciation model you're aiming for or what degree of divergence from that model do you feel is acceptable? And, and how do you deal with that with, a, with another kind of language that has that huge divergence of accent? So, um, actually, um, I, I did a lot of investigation about this, how should I teach and what should I teach and so on. And, um, again, in those standards for exams, for example, the only um, requirement to the pronunciation in Spanish is that your Spanish needs to be clear and understandable. So we have some sounds that, um, that are meaningful. For example, the O sound in Spanish, it can change the meaning of the word. For example, trabaja means he works, but traba trabajo means I work. So in this case, this is very important to pay attention to this O sound. Yeah, uh, or for example, the, um, the intonation like Traba, um, trabajo and trabajo, again, they are different words. They have the different stress syllable and they have different meaning. So this is important to, to be distinguished and this is important to, to be done. But the pronunciation, like having the standard Spanish pronunciation saying like uh, vamos a cenar 
or speaking in some latent accent like vamos a cenar or uh, vamos a cenar, it doesn't matter. So I always say to my students, like, you can mimic any accent you like. Mm -hmm. If you are into this Argentinian theme, you like tango, I have a student who actually, like, she's a huge fan of tango, I, I say, okay, you can mimic the pronunciation. If you want to live in Spain and it's important for you, you can try to make their pronunciation. I personally, during my classes, normally have this European pronunciation, but it's just because uh, when I began teaching, the majority of my students wanted to go to Spain, and I just got used to this uh, European pronunciation. Although, in, when I talk to people in real life, I prefer latent pronunciation because I lived in Ecuador, and I love it more. So, my only requirement to them is to not confuse these important sounds, which is normally only one, the O, <laughs> And uh, to put the stressed syllable in the correct way. Yeah. All the rest is not important. So as far as their language is clear, as far as I can understand what they say and people can understand what they say, it's it has no importance what accent they have. Because I also, when I started my career, I was a translator at a mythology plant and i worked with the japanese german people people from india i can't remember what other countries and they all spoke english they were engineers and workers and of course they spoke with um huge accents they their pronunciation was like very very far from perfect but yeah. my job was to translate and their job was to do what they were doing and explain things they did not come here to speak perfect yeah. english and that is what i tell my students if you are not a spy or if you are not going <laughs> to work on somewhere on national tv in spain your accent should not be uh, a problem for you. It, it, just, it, just like this. That was basically what we, we concluded on Friday when we were talking, which is, you know, the, the word stress is probably the most important thing. And beyond that, there's going to be, especially with vowel sounds, quite a lot of variation that's possible. And so if you take a word like enough, okay, mm -hmm. you, you don't want them kind of going enough and kind of pronouncing the g and the h at the end because that you know like what is that word but within within even within england itself you've got like enough enough you know and you're going to have those different vowel sounds and a lot of students are going to come to it and kind of go enough or enough fine you know that they're all fine so, so long as basically you're close to some sort of sound shape that that word generally has and I think it is very much to do with not messing up the particular distinctive vowel sounds usually, which change the meaning of things and basically getting the stress right. I, I was also curious because you said you lived in Ecuador, but when you, you tend to use more of a kind of European model, do you find yourself that you sometimes kind of switch, you know, you're doing like a bit of Ecuadorian Spanish and a bit more kind of Castilian Spanish and that they kind of mix up. Yeah, sometimes it happens. It happens yeah. sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Especially when I'm a bit tired or like thinking about something during the class, trying to explain something better, I sometimes switch. But it's all right. I know that there are certain, you know, some teachers get very hung up on whether you have a British or American accent as though it, in English, uh, as though they're completely separate things that never overlap. But, you know, obviously for, for loads and loads of young British kids, they grow up listening to you know, black American music, watching American movies, copying things that you hear in American movies, and it creeps into your own pronunciation as well as into your own vocabulary. And that idea that they're two separate things that never somehow mix or merge, I think is, is a, a bit of a fallacy. And I've never thought about it before, but I'm guessing it must happen with Spanish speakers as well. If you're, if you're a Latin American speaker of Spanish living and working in Spain, you're going to end up with this kind of mishmash of, of accents and vocabulary and all of those kind of things, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. It happens all the time. And sometimes, for example, people who, um, like I, I had a 
teacher at university who was a volunteer. His mother was from Cuba and his father was from Dominican Republic, so they have different accents. But they lived in the United States and their son was born in the United States of America, so his first language actually was English. And only after it, he spoke Spanish. So when he came to us and uh, we asked him to teach us Spanish, he spoke to us and I'm not sure what kind of pronunciation he had because yeah. it was just something in between Cuban and um, Dominican and maybe the influence of Mexican because he had some friends. It's, it's all in all and it's, it's just normal for languages to you know, get mixed up. Mix yeah, absolutely. And can you say a bit more about the speed and the problems that that poses for students and what kind of techniques you use to help your students deal with, you know, the, the kind of rapid fire speech of everyday Spanish? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, speed is actually a huge problem, as I've already said, and the only like way to teach students, to teach people to understand uh, is just to listen because they have to. And as I work mostly with teenagers and adults, I see that it's much easier to do with teenagers to teach them listen than to teach adults. And mostly I think this is due to adult people tend to try to control everything. And when they listen, they believe that they need to understand each word and they need to know the translation of each word all the time. And when they hear some word that they cannot distinguish or maybe a word which is unfamiliar to them, they get lost. They say, I don't know. I don't understand anything. I got lost and so on. So I try to make them listen as much as possible. And we do um, sometimes what we did um, during the conference, like, for example, we learned some words, for example, weather. And I find a video or a song which contains words related to this topic. Of course, you cannot find a song which will, all, which will be all about weather, but sometimes they have something about rain or sun or clouds. And then I make my students listen to this song and find the familiar words, or sometimes we have a list of words they have to underline when they hear them, uh, all these sorts of things. And then um, I, I just try, what, what I try to do is like uh, to make them distinguish familiar words so that they hear them even if they don't understand the context even if they do not know all of the content of this song or video they still can find the words that they know and they need to be able to hear them mm. and then also what i often do is i try to get different videos and different um, audios because they need to get used not only to the speed but also to the different accents Sometimes I like doing this, like we have some topic about furniture, for example, and then I show them a video where a person is speaking about their house and show is showing their like furniture, the rooms. And first we watch this video without the sound. And I ask my students to just um, write down all the words uh, when they see them, like they see a sofa and they write down sofa, uh, they see like a window and they write down la ventana, and then I play the video again but with the sound, and now they have to check if they uh, have written down all the words or maybe this person uses some other word for the same thing, not something which we learned, so I do this type of things interesting and when you're doing like drilling with your students or pronunciation do, do you get them to kind of practice saying things slower and then saying things a bit faster just to kind of help them get their their tongues up to speed themselves yes. as well I, I actually uh really like using tongue twisters and uh because it's, it's kind of funny and everybody likes <laughs> It, and it makes everybody laugh. So we get some Spanish tongue twisters, uh, usually at the beginner level. And we, first we just uh, try to pronounce them slowly, uh, word by word. Then we just try to pronounce it slowly, but not separating the words so that they're just one in the same line. And then we try to gain some speed because, as I always tell people, 
it's easier to understand the people who speak like you. So if you're a slow speaker, it will be more difficult for you to understand people who speak fast. But for the people who speak fast in their native language, it's not much of a problem to understand people in, in another language. So of course we cannot change the pattern, the way the person speaks normally, but at least uh, we try to get there. We try to speed up a little bit ourselves and make this like uh, hear themselves pronounce these phrases without pauses um, quickly so that when they hear other people speaking this way it, it's like I hope it's easier for them to understand oh so, someone's just saying they miss my classes that's nice to hear <laughs> um it's interesting as well I, I think oh wait a minute I've lost my train of thought by that comment now what was I going to say <laughs> Give me a minute to come back to it. Okay. Yeah, so when you were saying about it's easier to understand people who speak like you, okay, I was also just thinking about how I know there's a lot of research into the fact, it's funny because native speakers are kind of fetishized and held up as these models of teaching um, and, and models of, of output, but actually in a lot of international contexts, native speakers are often the problem because you get these groups of say i don't know you know a kazakh speaker of english a greek speaker of english a guatemalan speaker of english and a guy from london and the first three all tend to understand each other fine and it's the guy from london that they have the most problems understanding often because native speakers aren't very good at grading their language or making themselves intelligible. They're not good at speaking their own mother tongue as an international language, if you like. Yeah. And they just, they don't know how to do that a lot of the time. So, you know, maybe they just speak more slowly, like you're an idiot or something. So I was thinking about that. And then I was also just wondering maybe how, how, how it's been for you as a non-native speaker teacher of Spanish um, and, and what, what role I guess your non-nativeness plays or do, do you have in Spanish in the kind of world of Spanish language teaching is there the same kind of oh you need a native speaker teacher kind of thing or is that more of an English language thing or and how does it affect your own kind of identity and feelings about your job as a teacher? Uh, you know, um, it's interesting because a um, couple of years ago, uh, it was really, really uh, fashionable uh, among the learners to find and to study with natives. So uh, they would look for a teacher and ask you like, oh, at least did you live somewhere in a Spanish speaking country? And they would prefer a person who has no teaching education, but who lives in a Spanish speaking country, or for example, if they are a native, they would prefer this person to somebody who has the training, has experience and education, but not a native. But um, since the beginning of war, a lot of people had to immigrate uh, for different reasons and from Ukraine, of course, and from Russia as well, um, and from Kazakhstan, because um, previously people from Kazakhstan used to go to study to Russia or China. Yeah. And nowadays, it seems like it's it's a little bit problematic. So uh, more and more people uh, tend to go to study to Spain. Okay. And now they realize that when they go there to a native teacher, sometimes they come across this problem that the teacher does not understand what their problem is, yeah. why they cannot understand something. Because, for example, in Russian and in Kazakh, we have a system of verb tenses, which is completely different from Spanish and I as a Russian speaker as a person who speaks Kazakh also I can understand this yeah. struggle and when my students like um, get stuck somewhere like they don't understand subjuntivo or something like this I say okay relax we don't have this in Russian we don't have this in Kazakh you cannot make any um, analogies here because even if you tried it won't make sense. You just have to accept. Sometimes um, there are things that, that are similar in Russian and Spanish or Kazakh and Spanish. And in these cases, I just can use these languages and say, look, it's just 
something we have here and it works like this and we can compare so yeah um i can say that mostly it helps me yeah. it helps me more than it hinges me and um, it seems to me that nowadays, um, at least among the um, Russian-speaking community, Kazakh-speaking community, we don't have these prejudges against the non-native teachers as we had several years ago. It's interesting. And I mean, I, I think what you've said about teaching Spanish is, is very, very applicable for so-called non-natives also teaching English because, you know, anyone who's learned English as a foreign language, A, has actually learned it and they haven't just picked it up by accident of birth like I did. Uh, and B, I think the fact that they've learned it gives them a particular understanding of the struggles that you're going to encounter, particularly coming from a certain language group. And I mean, this was the thing I was talking about when I was in Astana, which is if you're a, a Kazakh speaker or a Russian speaker and you're working with people who you understand the first language of, you're going to be much, much more sensitive towards and aware of the kinds of blocks or walls that those people are going to hit. Because it's like, yeah, been there, done that. You know, understand that kind of feeling myself. And I, I think that's a real strength and a real power for any kind of non-native speaker teacher of, of any language. So that was interesting. I was talking to Andrew, um, my co-partner, because he, he also, he lived in Valencia for a while and he teaches spanish with lexical lab and we were sort of talking about how his experience of being a non-native speaker teacher of spanish is different to his experience of being a teacher of english and you know the kind of the reflections that he'd been having upon all on all of that kind of thing as well so thank you for sharing your own experience there um i think that's me done to be honest alex i, I covered everything i wanted to cover and Thank you so much for, for sharing your own experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. That was great. That there's so much overlap with things that I often think about and talk about when it comes to teaching English. So hearing someone talking in English about teaching Spanish and realizing that there were so many similarities and that you come up against such kind of similar issues and similar problems and it was really, really interesting for me. So um, thank you. I hope it brings you a few more students and, um, okay. you know, and thank you so much for sharing your perspective and for your opinion and your positions. Thank you. That was a pleasure for me to just to, to be here tonight to speak to you. Like, thanks a lot. Thank you. And, awesome. and keep in touch, Alex. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Bye. Take care. Take care. Take care.